<laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and jump right into the talk. So uh, uh, thank you all for, for joining tonight. Um, as Cynthia mentioned, um, literally in the first week of the lockdown and the pandemic, uh, uh, this book I'd been working on for about a year and a half was, was published. I was really looking forward tonight to actually speaking in person because uh, Zoom talks have, have been the way um, I, I get, uh, get to talk about this work. Um, and uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had graduate students send me manuscripts to review without a title. And, and I always ask them, well, how do you know what the story is if you don't have a title? And, and when I set out on this book, I, I actually struggled for a bit with the title, but I had taken up boat building as a hobby, looking forward to at least semi-retirement. Um, and, um, and so aside from the cheesy nautical metaphors that I'll sprinkle this talk with, um, this notion of forests adrift really captured the way I was thinking about forests. And so you'll you'll hear that theme repeated as we go through. Um, so I'm, uh, let's see, there we go. So, you know, as a forest ecologist, I'm used to thinking in time scales of centuries, if not millennia. Um, you know, the average lifespan of, of, of pretty much all of our local tree species is measured in hundreds of years. Um, and, and so, and, and the other thing about forests is that they have an enormous amount of, of um, legacy. So things that happened as much as a thousand years in the past can still be shaping what happens in these forests today. And so what I wanna to do today is, is basically, you know, as a forest ecologist, I'm primarily interested in understanding where the forests are going, but you can't do that without knowing where they've been. So I'm gonna talk mostly tonight about um, you know, where those, where the, where the forests that we live in now, uh, where did they come from, and, and, and just hint at where they're going based on all, the, all of these trends. So I'm going to start by just a, a couple of comments about the nature of Hudson Valley Forest prior to European settlement, including, um, you know, ongoing debates about the impacts of Native Americans on those forests. And then I'm just going to walk through, you know, really in, in synopsis, um, the kinds of, of processes historically that I think have shaped these forests. So uh, this, this complicated diagram, I am a scientist, and so this is actually maybe one of the only, one of the few data uh, slides in the talk, but so most of what we know about the post-glacial history of our forests comes from the work of, of some fairly, a very diligent scientists known as paleontologists. These are people who take cores of lake sediments and then slice out a little bit of the sediment as all the way back, dissolve that sediment, look at it under a microscope and count, identify the species of pollen preserved in the sediment. So um, you can work back until the lake was formed and, and most of these cores you know, can take you back all the way to just after the retreat of the, of the ices of the glaciers, uh, roughly 12 to 14,000 years ago. Um, the, the, and, and so the way to look at these graphs is the, you know, the axis goes from, from current zero years before present all the way back 12,000 years. And then for each of these groups of species, they're um, mostly uh, genera, not individual species in most cases, you can see how abundant that species was in, in the past. The, you know, I picked two lakes here, um, Heart Lake and the Adirondacks. If you've ever climbed Mount Marcy, you know Heart Lake. It's it's where you set off to, to reach the summit of, of, uh, Lake, of uh, Mount Marcy. Um, and, and so a little, and I want it there for contrast with uh, Sutherland Ponds. If any of you have ever hiked in Black Rock Forest off uh, on the backside of Storm King Mountain, a beautiful forest. Um, uh, it's has a long history. Um, Sutherland Pond is um, has had a very deep core of almost 10 meters of sediment, and uh, uh, Terry Ann Menzig Melch did a really elaborate, very detailed reconstruction, a lot of sampling. And what you see in, in Sutherland Pond is is between 12,000 and 10,000 years ago, you know, the first woody colonists, the first forests we established are sort of the spruce fir pine forests that would come in in the very cold dry climate as the ice retreated. Um, but then very quickly, beginning about eight, 
9,000 years ago, oaks become dominant in this, in this core and stay dominant in the Hudson Highlands for 8,000 years. Yeah. All the way through that, there's also charcoal present. Um, and and this, issue, this notion of the importance of fire um, will, will come up several times in this talk. And, but what I want to say about this graph is that you know, typically what a paleontologist will do is they'll stare at that thing for a long time, drink a whole mm -hmm. lot of coffee, and then try <laughs> to interpret the changes based on what, what they think has happened with climate. In fact, the, one of the, these were first used to try to guess at what climate was in the past, because we know that, you know, spruce is like cold climates, and if there's a lot of spruce, it must be cold. Um, but, but the real lesson I take from this is that there's been an enormous amount of change over time and, and that these species tend to vary individualistically. Um, uh, one of the most striking patterns in, in these graphs is that hemlock all throughout the Northeast um, drops uh, precipitously, almost disappears from the landscape about 5,000 years ago. And again, ecologists have debated why this is. We think it's the only instance in the historical record uh, prior to European settlement of an introduced uh, insect uh, largely almost wiping out a tree species. Um, but other than that, you know, there's just an enormous amount of change happening here. But throughout that period, Native Americans are present in this landscape. And there are really three, three um, areas where we, um, where we think, or at least there's been discussion and debate, of how Native Americans might have altered these forests. The first is this really quite remarkable extinction of all of the mammals in North America larger than the bison. 90 genera of, of, of large mammals, including the, the, uh, uh, the mastodons that, well, how recently did somebody was putting a pool in in Hyde Park and as they were digging, discovered mastodon bones. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, the um, Oh, it's been almost 60, 70 years since uh, Paul Sears, an ecologist in Ohio, uh, actually Paul Martin, proposed that um, the extinction of all of these species was linked to the arrival of Native Americans and their hunting uh, pressures. Um, it's um, still quite debated. It's believed that climate change could have also and, and was likely a big part of this. But for whatever reason, there was this massive extinction event in North America and not just in North America but all in, in all of the continents at the end of the Pleistocene at the end of the Ice Age. Um, one of the remarkable things is that we really can't say that the loss of all these large mammals had an impact on the forest. Um, many of these animals were species of the of the cold steppes, these sort of semi-deserts that are at the margin of an ice sheet. So yes, um, it's very clear that that an enormous number of species went extinct in North America. It's not entirely clear why, and it's not entirely clear that the loss of those species yeah, had a major well. impact on the forests. Um, but at the same time, yeah, there's well. um, always been this debate about whether Native Americans were responsible for um, the fires that clearly burned throughout, particularly Southern New England and, and south of here, particularly in oak forests. So all of these pollen cores in these lake sediments in those regions show charcoal. Um, and um, early, uh, early settlers and uh, uh, the botanical explorers writing and, uh, for folks back in, in Europe um, commented on the frequency of fire in the landscape and um, um, there were frequent references to the uh, to the notion that the fires were deliberately set by Native Americans. But um, Emily Russell, who's really one of the best uh, historical ecologists in the uh, in in this part of the world, went back to all those records and and there's actually none of the none of the records actually claim to have actually seen anyone set the fires. So this debate has gone back and forth, but. Uh, it's very clear that fires were a, a very frequent uh, part of the landscape. And unlike the loss of the animals, it's clear that um, the changes that have happened in the fire regimes do have big impacts. And finally, um, Native American agriculture, um, corn really only shows up um, uh, 
in the Northeast about a thousand years ago, so maybe five, six hundred years before European settlement. And, and so it's believed that uh, the amount of land cleared for agriculture by Native American cultures and, and communities was, was probably quite small and limited to the best soils. And so, you know, all in all, you know, the picture that emerges is of a, of a dynamic forest landscape, but, but a landscape in the Northeast that was almost entirely forested. Um, maybe 15, 20 percent at most of the landscape having been cleared either because uh, uh, cleared of forest, either because it was too dry and rocky for forests or because it was cleared for agriculture. But of course, all of this changed dramatically with European settlement and more specifically with the arrival of farmers. And so here in this part of Dutchess County, and uh, particularly inland from the river, you know, we're really talking about 1740, 1750. And, and of course, you know, we're lucky to have this, this, this wonderful Bill McDermott's Clinton uh, history of a town. Um, you know, the, the U.S. has this marvelous um, tradition of, of local town historians. And so the, the story varies um, from region to region. The Housatonic Valley is different from the Hudson Valley, is different from the Connecticut Valley. But in all, uh, particularly throughout Southern New England, uh, there was this um, very early and, and, and re really quite remarkable um, settlement period in which um, farms were literally hacked out of the wilderness. And so here in Clinton, where I live and where many of you live, you know, when the, it was part of the Nine Partners patent, um, 1697, uh, land speculators from Manhattan, who I noticed McDermott, um, uh, 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 states in his book that, that it, it's not clear that the nine partners ever set foot in Dutchess County, um, that they, they bought this land on speculation, um, trapped beaver from it to sell into the London market, and then were eventually sort of pressured into um, surveying it and subdividing it for farmers. Um, but that early farming was really, um, uh, wheat was the cash crop, and uh, um, but anybody who, who farms in this, in, in, on these soils knows just how poor these soils are. And, and very quickly, um, wheat yields began to decline. Um, by the late 1700s, um, Hessian fly and wheat rust had, had uh, been introduced from Europe and further um, hammered the, the wheat yields. In fact, the Hudson Valley was the breadbasket for the early um, Republic and the decline in the wheat yields in the Hudson Valley was considered of significant enough strategic value that Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, Jefferson was appointed to a commission to investigate the causes. And he and Madison arrived in peak scale one day and took a carriage ride up to Albany talking to farmers about what the problems were. Um, uh, that problem was never solved. What, 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 uh, what changed um, this story and, and in many ways the most probably the single most important ecological event in the history of Dutchess County was the opening of the Erie Canal in 1825. Um, and then, you know, basically this happens. Um, the Erie Canal opens, farmers can, can abandon their, you know, marginal fields here in Dutchess County, move to Ohio, the the the, uh, the value of the canal was not in getting to Ohio. In fact, by all accounts, traveling on the canal westward was a dismal affair with mosquitoes and malaria and a very slow barge. Um, but the, the canal allowed the produce uh, generated in those rich soils in Ohio to be brought back to, to Albany, down the locks, and then down the Hudson to the population centers or even sent over to Europe. And so you know, the, again, this is a, a graph from, from uh, McDermott's book. The, the population in the town of Clinton peaked in the 1820 census and then didn't go above that until after World War II. Um, basically, farmers left. And as, as farmers left, the ones who stayed behind would buy the neighbor's land, keep their best fields in agriculture, and begin to allow land uh, to be abandoned. And so there, it's the beginning of, of uh, what was called old field succession in Dutchess County and in, in throughout Southern New England. And then eventually you start to see the establishment of uh, the reestablishment of forests. And so, you know, 
other than the very, very few true old growth stands in Dutchess County, um, the, our oldest forests tend to date from the Erie Canal. Um, and then they also date from a, a series of, of agricultural depressions in the 1870s when more land was abandoned. And then the Great Depression of the 1920s um, that led to the abandonment of even more land. And so, um, you know, the Dutchess County uh, Cooperative Extension has a bulletin from, I think it's 1915, um, in which it, it points out that 80% of Dutchess County land has been, quote, improved. Um, what that basically means is cleared of forest. Um, and, you know, the remaining 20% that was not improved um, was still valuable. It was valuable as woodlots and for firewood, um, for some timber. Um, but it was really restricted to, you know, the steepest slopes and the rockiest hilltops. Um, um, contrast that with you know, with what's happened today, Dutchess County is 60% forested um, by our calculations. So it's been a, a really quite remarkable uh, story of clearing and then recovering. Um, what's missing? Well, you know, this, I suppose, still surprises me, but the trees were the first things to reestablish. Um, the native forest understory in these forests that have grown back on agricultural lands is still largely missing all the native wildflowers and even many of the native shrubs. And so um, if you want to find uh, the native understory, you really need to go into one of those few woodlot forests or old growth stands that were never put under plow. Um, so it, it's really an open question. Have these forests recovered? Um, you know, the notion of the pre-settlement landscape has always been a touchstone for our thinking about conservation, about, you know, what we would like to uh, protect and restore. Um, one of the things I want to, you know, I'm going to stress throughout the rest of this talk is that um, uh, we, we've really set these forests off on entirely new trajectories. The, yes, we have trees back. Um, the question is, do they even remotely resemble what was here before? Um, as an example, at, um, you know, when I first got to the Cary Institute in 1984, one of my first uh, tasks was to do a study of the forests at the Institute so we knew what we had for purposes of research and so forth. And, and um, one of the things we just, you know, we, we, uh, we did a very detailed reconstruction of the historical land use of every piece of land in the, at the Cary Arboretum on its roughly 2,000 acres. And, and we discovered that there were sort of three types of forests on the, on the Arboretum property. The first were the forests on the steepest slopes that would, had never been cleared for agriculture. They were dominated by chestnut oak and red oak, for instance. And they had been heavily cut repeatedly throughout the last, you know, 250 years, uh, but never put into agriculture of any sort. Um, the other two types of forests broke out quite cleanly on whether the most recent land use had been pasture. And, you know, by, um, geez, you know, with the opening of the Erie Canal and the decline of, of, of wheat as a cash crop, dairy became really the dominant cash um, uh, product uh, from Dutchess County Farms and then the beginning of orchards and things like that. But, you know, um, dairy remained an important part of Dutchess County agriculture until, what, the 1980s when the feds bought out all of our remaining dairy herds. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, so there were lots of, um, there was lots of pasture land in Dutchess County in, the, say, the 1920s through the 1960s or 70s. And as those lands uh, were no longer grazed, um, those are the lands where oaks survive because farmers left oaks scattered in the pastures. They provided shade for livestock and they also, uh, the acorns were, um, you know, uh, food for the animals. But if a land if a parcel was abandoned from a cultivated field, um, you get a completely different forest, one dominated by the wind dispersed species like red maple, white pine and white ash. And, and those forests have no historical analog. There's nothing like those maple, pine, ash forests anywhere in that pollen uh, profile from uh, Sutherland Pond. Um, we simply don't think this, this type of forest existed prior to European settlement. 
So agriculture has had, you know, just lasting impacts and has created entirely new forests in, in the valley. I want to shift and, and talk just a little bit about forestry because, you know, I, I think to most people, if you just ask which was more destructive ecologically, agriculture or forestry, they would probably say forestry. And, and, and that just turns out to be not the case. Um, the early forestry um, uh, was mostly, you know, a, as a major activity restricted to the highlands, the higher or the steeper slopes, and then the Catskills or the Hudson Highlands, or the Housatonics. Um, and, and it was remarkably industrious. Um, you know, it was mostly done in winter because, um, you know, you could, um, you could use sleds and drag the logs. In the Adirondacks, you would, you would store up the logs um, along a stream, dam the stream, and then blow the dam and float all, shoot the logs down to the, to the mills at the, at the bottom of the watershed. Um, uh, the hemlock industry was, was really quite remarkable, and uh, particularly in the Catskills in the 1830s, hides were being hauled on clipper ships from South America and then hauled by cart, ox carts up into the Catskills where hemlock bark was abundant. Um, but basically they clear cut the Catskills just to strip the bark off the hemlocks and then you cut the other wood for, for fuel and timber. Um, it's pretty clear from uh, witness tree records um, of the, at that time that um, hemlock still has not recovered its previous abundance. It doesn't sprout the way the hardwoods do. Um, so, you know, these were remarkably intensive industries, um, but they have far fewer lasting legacies on the nature of the current forest, with, with the exception of the, of the case of hemlock. You know, the forests in the Catskills, um, you know, they were not plowed. And so the understory, for instance, probably still resembles quite closely the understory of a forest that was there prior to the logging. Um, certainly, a lot of the early successional tree species are more abundant now than they would have been, you know, but by and large, the recovery from a logging event is, is not that different from recovery from a windstorm or recovery from a natural fire. So, um, I, I, I'm a, I spend a lot of time in the Adirondacks. I work with a lot of environmental organizations there and and um, but this also applies here through the Catskill Forest Preserve. Really, in a lot of ways, uh, the enduring legacy of that that um, extensive wave of logging was uh, this remarkable amendment to our New York State Constitution, adopted in 1894, against all expectation, that created the the New York State Forest Preserve lands as forever wild, and so you know, basically almost 3 million acres of forest in the Adirondacks and several hundred thousand acres of the Catskill are the, have the strongest legal protection of any wilderness land in the U.S. Um, New York State's Forest Preserve represents about 70 percent of the legally protected lands, uh, from, from logging at least, uh, in the Northeast and the largest wilderness areas north of the Everglades and east of the Boundary Waters. And so, um, you know, really quite remarkable. Um, um, you know, but but beginning, you know, that early logging, uh, you know, then pivoted uh, around 1900 as railroads were established. And again, this is something that was happened in the Adirondacks, but that had impacts throughout the Northeast. That early logging with railroads. Um, uh, allowed two things. It meant that you could clear cut. The, the previous logging was mostly to cut the softwoods because they were the trees you could float down the river. And so there really was very little clear cutting in that first wave. Um, but once you had railroads, you could take everything. And so vast areas were clear cut and an enormous amount of slash left behind. These railroads were supposed to, by law, have spark arresters um, to keep sparks from these locomotives from you know, flying out and setting fire to the slash around them. But of course, many of them did not have the arresters. And there were a series of massive fires in the Adirondacks that burned, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of acres, consumed whole towns. 1903 and 1908 in particular uh, burned areas of almost a half million acres in the Adirondacks. Um, you know, fires were, were quite common here in, in Hudson Valley, but much more readily uh, contained than this because we didn't have this this massive um, 
mechanized logging happening. But because of those fires, um, we have fire towers. <laughs> and, and, and this pretty much, you know, this story played out all across the US. Um, you know, beginning in about 1920, um, whether it was a state or a federal forest manager, um, um, suppressing fires became, um, you know, uh, priority number one. And um, uh, it, we were remarkably successful at this. Um, and an enormous number of mostly young men got to spend their summers uh, sitting in these fire towers. If you've ever read Norman Plains, uh, um, A River Runs Through It, the stories there about his time as a fire tower in Montana. Um, and uh, of course, Rhinecliff Forest still has one of these and Stissing Mountain still has one of these. Um, and yet it's pretty clear that the legacy of this fire suppression has been um, a really important transformation of the, of the forest. So for instance, um, the original surveys done, the way you marked the corner of a survey was you recorded the species and size of the nearest tree. These are called witness trees. Um, this was um, standardized uh, in 1875 by the US government. You know, that one mile square grid system that occurs from Ohio West every corner of every one of those sections of one square mile, um, uh, two trees were recorded. And halfway along each line, two trees were recorded. So we have a remarkable um, snapshot of the composition of the forest um, at the time the surveys were done. And, and volunteers at the Arboretum back in the 1970s went through all the deeds of the property um, that make up the 2000 acres and recorded the species of trees mentioned by the surveyors. And in those original surveys, 80% of the trees, 75% of the trees were oaks, and there were almost no maples mentioned as, as witness trees. Um, the current forest, based on the work we did in 1984, is about 40% oak and 40% maple. And what we know about these species is that the oaks are very, uh, very tolerant of fire. They have thick bark, and they need more light. And so ground fires creeping through the understory tend to keep the canopy open and create ideal conditions for oaks to regenerate. Uh, the maples have really thin bark and they're very sensitive to fire, but they're very shade tolerant. And so if you suppress fire, uh, you allow the maples to invade the oak forest. That's, it's quite dark now outside, but as I look out my window here, you know, that this, uh, this neighborhood where I live in Clinton, um, you know, it was a dairy farm and then um, was um, a lot of pasture, came back to oak forest, but now the understory, all of the smaller trees are maples. And over time, those maples are going to shade out the oaks and, and the oaks are going to continue to decline. And this is um, pretty inexorable. Um, in fact, the more maple you have in a forest, the less flammable it is because oak leaves are the fuel for fire in the spring here. Maple leaves decompose over the winter and aren't all that flammable in the spring. And so over time, we've converted a landscape that was very susceptible to fire into one that is less likely each year to burn. Um, you know, and at the same time that the forests were, were so remarkably successful at restoring themselves without any um, deliberate human intervention, um, white-tailed deer showed pretty much the same trajectory. Um, this is, um, but with a lot of very deliberate uh, human management to bring this about. So in the late 1800s, um, subsistence hunting for deer had driven down deer populations in New York to the point where the New York State estimated that there were likely less than a dozen deer in the entire Catskill region. Think about that for a minute. In the last few years, roughly 7,000 deer are, are taken by hunters every year in the Catskills. Um, that's from a population that was less than a dozen deer, um, you know, 120, 140 years ago. The only viable population of deer still in existence in New York State was believed to be in the heart of the Adirondacks in the deeper, deeper snows and where there were fewer people to hunt them. Um, deer had to be reintroduced to Connecticut. They were considered extinct in Connecticut in about 1909, I believe they were, they were deliberately brought back. 
And then hunting laws. So for instance, in, in New York State, um, Western New York, all deer hunting was prohibited from 1900 to World War II. You could not hunt legally at all. And so, you know, that, uh, you know, the whole point of, of hunter man, of deer population management was to restore the population. I, I guess you would basically say it's been um, successful beyond um, what anyone might have hoped. Um, you know, current densities are believed to be anywhere from two to 10 times what they would have been in pre-settlement times. And the, the picture here in the lower right is, um, is what happens with the current deer densities. That um, It's maybe a little hard to see, but there's a fence there on, to the, on the left side of that photograph. And inside that fence, uh, there are no deer. The fence is there to keep deer out. And, and there's a dense understory of seedlings and saplings and shrubs. And outside that fence, there's nothing that gets taller than your, your really your ankles because the deer graze it down. In fact, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy a few years ago uh, did a study of uh, statewide assessment of forest regeneration and basically concluded that pretty much all of the Hudson Valley forests have um, really inadequate regeneration. And that's almost entirely a product of the presence of very high deer densities. Um, so, so I, I want to talk for a minute about, um, you know, I, I, I've talked a bit about the sort of the early pre-industrial logging, um, but for the last 60, 70 years, um, uh, logging has become, um, you know, a, a very different process in the Hudson Valley and throughout the Northeast. So in that, that the picture in the upper right is what you might expect most logging to be, a clear cut. Uh, this would be called a variable retention cut by a forester. They left that little tuft of trees right in the middle for reasons that I don't know. I happen to be flying over this. But in the lower left is, is what most logging, particularly in the Hudson Valley now, how it's done. And it's done um, with partial harvesting. Um, foresters consider this uh, foresters think that the picture on the upper right is probably much better forestry than the picture on the lower left because the partial harvesting often involves just simply coming in and taking the most valuable trees and leaving all the low-grade trees behind. Um, and that's certainly a problem here in the Hudson Valley. If you talk to, to a DEC forester, uh, they will say that, that the picture on the lower left is, is, is a real problem, that we're degrading the forests with this kind of logging. I, I think there's a middle ground. There are um, there are ways to do that partial harvesting in in a in, uh, in a you know, as as really good management. Um, there are also ways to do it poorly. Um, but you know it's it's hard to argue that forestry remains a major factor in Hudson Valley forests. There are just too many people. Parcels are too small. There certainly still is harvesting taking place. Uh, but the really intensive, you know, the bulk of, of logging in, in New York happens um, in the far north, in the Adirondacks, and then across the northern forests. That said, um, you know, where it is happening, it does have impacts. Um, in particular, this partial harvesting is, is really, you know, that story of the maples gradually replacing the oaks. Well, this just plays into that. Um, you know, the oaks are, are a big saw log size oak is valuable and likely to be uh, harvested. Um, and the maples are more shade tolerant and can uh, can do quite well in a canopy that's open to just say 10, 20, 30, 40% of the trees removed. And so, um, you know, a forester would say that that partial harvesting is working against keeping oak in the landscape, and that if we wanted to really restore oaks, we'd need to be thinking about much more deliberate uh, logging to create the light environment that the oaks need. So there are a, a lot of issues here. This is, um, you know, really up to individual landowners how they want to manage their forests. But um, but clearly the the way that you practice, if, if a forest is harvested, the way it's harvested uh, does have impacts. Um, Again, this is really only a factor, but for almost 75 years now, forests of the Hudson Valley have been exposed to a wide range of air pollution. Um, this is one of the few threats to forests in which there's actually an upside. The Clean Air Act amendments of 1990 um, have been you know, really pretty remarkably 
effective at reducing both the acidity of, of rain falling in the in the uh, Hudson Valley and the amount of sulfur dioxide and sulfuric acid coming in. I don't know if any of you um, ever swam in Lake Minnewaska or Lake Awasting 40, 50 years ago. It was so acidic that, you know, it burned your eyes. Um, uh, but it was that marvelous light blue color, <laughs> lifeless, but but beautiful. Um, in recent years, when I've been over in Minnewaska, I realized that uh, Lake Minnewaska is sort of looking more like a normal lake and, and doesn't sting your eyes if you swim in it. Um, it's because there's much less acidity landing in the lake and um, fish are beginning to return to the lake. Um, uh, ozone, CO2 fertilization, um, oddly enough, ozone is worse here than in New York City, even though the nitrogen oxides that lead to the formation of ozone come out of New York City out of tailpipes, automobiles, and then drift up here and then cook up. Ozone's a product of sunlight and nitrous, nitrogen oxides and temp high temperatures. So summer, our summer ozone levels here in the, in the Mid-Hudson Valley are worse than in New York City, and you can find damage to plants from them. But, but it, it's a little hard for me to argue that it's a major impact on our forests, but certainly still a, a chronic problem. Nitrogen deposition is an interesting story because the Clean Air Act amendments didn't really regulate nitrogen emissions very effectively. And it turns out that nitrogen is a fertilizer. And in fact, uh, we, a number of us showed uh, some years ago now that the, the nitrogen coming in and air pollution, mostly coming from Midwestern power plants, was actually fertilizing our forests and increasing the growth of some species, um, but uh, increasing the mortality of others. So there's certain, there are winners and losers here. Uh, nitrogen levels are slowly declining, so we're, we're seeing some progress on reducing that form of pollution. You know, another big change in the last hundred years has been um, the arrival of, of all sorts of new passengers, the, particularly the invasive plants. Um, you know, this is a topic that, that uh, gets a lot of attention, particularly from, from um, volunteers who are willing to invest the work in local preserves to try to control these, these invasives. It, it's, it's, it's worth pointing out that about 30% of the plant species in New York are non-native. And, and most of our roadside wildflowers, for instance, are European weeds that, that settlers brought over with them on, in the hay and their ships and so forth. Um, and only a small percentage, maybe a couple of percent, three, four, five percent of the non-native species are invasive. Um, and, and we're not blameless in this. The most common tree in uh, many parts of Central Europe is our black locust, which was taken to Europe because honey from black locust flowers was particularly prized by Europeans in the 18th and 19th century. Um, black locust is a nitrogen fixer. It colonizes degraded industrial lands really well. And so the former Iron Curtain countries are just full of it. Um, black cherry is one of the most common trees in the low countries, the Netherlands and, and uh, uh, Holland, uh, you know, um, uh, but it never grows to a big, valuable furniture grade tree there. Um, but we do have a long list of species. And, um, you know, the point I want to make, though, is that, you, you know, remember I talked about the sparseness of the recovery of the native understory. Um, you know, uh, people got all excited about pulling garlic mustard. It's very satisfying to pull garlic mustard out of your woods. It's easy to pull up. If you get it before it flowers, you can yank it right out. It's a biennial. So um, the first year, it's just a low rosette and the, the, the flowering stalk shoots up. You yank it out and it's done. Um, and uh, you can actually make pesto out of it if you're so inclined. Uh, it is um, toxic to the fungi that the trees need, but not enough so that it really seems to be having an impact. And, and I really cannot um, convincingly argue that the presence of garlic mustard is having any negative impact on any native understory tree species. And this is because the understory is simply not saturated with, with species. Um, we're still missing so many of the native species 
Um, most of the shrubs in these post-agricultural forests are non-native, the honeysuckles, the multiflora roses, um, and um, they're important habitat for, for birds and small mammals. Um, the canopy trees that are invading are a different story. You can only pack so many trees in the canopy, so species like Tree of Heaven and Norway Maple, as they become more abundant, they will displace native species, but we did really thorough work on at least those two species, and the postdocs were really disappointed in the results because our, our results told us that the invasion was going to be really slow. It was going to take centuries before Tree of Heaven or Norway Maple really made a dent in the native forests, and that meant the story was not nearly as scary and as exciting as they had hoped. Um, but yes, the you know they are slowly making their way into the forests. But the invasives that really matter are, are not the invasive plants. Um, you know, if you ask any forest ecologist, what is what has been the most important uh, human impact on, on U.S. forests in the East, at least in the last hundred years, this is the answer. Um, I don't know anybody who disagrees with this. You know, the list is depressing and long. Um, chestnut blight, you know, Dutch elm disease, beech bark disease, um, beech bark disease, uh, be was brought um, to the to North America on a beach, a European beech sapling being brought to the botanic gardens in Nova Scotia. Um, it's a combination of a, of a small insect and a fungus uh, that together just have devastated um, uh, beach populations um, in the Northeast. Um, Dutch elm disease wiped out most of the elms in the floodplains where they're abundant, although you can still find elms that are scattered in the upland forest because the beetle that spreads the fungus uh, that is the actual disease agent, the beetle's not very good at finding those isolated elms. And so there are still elms all through the Hudson Valley forest, but eventually they do get found by the beetle and then they succumb to Dutch elm disease. Um, some of you will remember that massive gypsy moth outbreak of the early 80s. I remember driving from Ithaca to Rhode Island to see family. Uh, in you know late June of 1980 or 81, it would have been when there was nothing except grass green on that entire eight-hour drive. They had defoliated every every plant, every woody plant uh, that we drove through um, on that drive. Um, uh, but very soon after that, a, a fungus appeared that has been um, kept those populations in check. Many of you will have seen some gypsy moth defoliation. In the last few years, I noticed some egg masses on trees in my yard. Um, I don't expect it to be a major impact. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid, most of you probably know the story of the woolly adelgid. This was brought to the U.S. It's believed on, again, on a, a an ornamental, on a hemlock um, brought from uh, uh, Asia uh, into a nursery in Virginia and it spread um, we're at the northern limit of the cold tolerance of the insect, and so um, we still have some hemlocks surviving, but pretty much hemlocks south of here are, have been um, decimated. Emerald ash borer, you can't drive around Hudson Valley Forest uh, in the last few years without seeing dead ash trees everywhere. Um, there are about 15 species of ashes in, in the U.S. all the way across the continent, and uh, as best we can tell, all of them are vulnerable to the emerald ash borer. The insect spreads faster than pretty much anything we've ever measured. And, uh, you know, it's quite possible that um, we could lose virtually all of these species. Um, you know, beech leaf disease is, is a new one that, that uh, I was hiking in Fonstock um, uh, this uh, summer and noticed on, we're still not entirely sure what's happening there. The story here is, is basically one of global trade. Um, this is a, a nice, scary graph. This is the, um, the number of non-native forest pests per county in the U.S. This is an old graph from Sandy Liebold uh, using data through 2012. Um, and, and basically what's happening is that um, global trade coming into the ports in, in New York and New Jersey unloads two things, either the live plant trade or the solid wood packing. Um, so whatever shipped over mostly from Asia and, and, and 
you know, those, those containers that come off those ships, inside each of those containers are pallet after pallet of solid wood packing used to, to uh, uh, load that, uh, that cargo. And insects burrowed into that wood back in, in Asia, that wood is supposed to be treated, but often is not. And the, the wood is, uh, the load is unpacked, the pallets are tossed out back of the, you know, uh, whatever business uh, got the, the uh, shipment. And then the insect emerges and finds suitable hosts here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just, um, you know, we know what the problem is. It's been going on for a hundred years. Um, the federal government has um, a program to try to stop this, but it's just woefully underfunded. Um, uh, I'm going to skip past this. Beech is a tree that's particularly um, I'm particularly fond of. I did my PhD on the ecology of sugar maple and beech, but uh, you know, it, it was a, a tree that distributed from the Maritimes of Canada to Mexico and hardly any of them ever reached a large mature size without uh, uh, succumbing to the disease. I just want to say a, a quick word about uh, an initiative um, championed by my uh, colleague Gary Lovett at the Cary Institute. Some of you know Gary and know that uh, very tragically just before Christmas he collapsed while skiing in the Catskills and, and passed away. But Gary started at the same time I did. We both sort of semi-retired at the same time a year and a half ago, but Gary retired to try to take on this challenge. And had, Gary came up with this uh, initiative called Tree Smart Trade. And he has spent a lot of time in Washington, a lot of time uh, meeting with the shipping industry and uh, the nursery industry uh, to try to strengthen um, the protections against these. And I, I think it's incredibly important work and work that I hope will continue. Um, I'm going to end on the on sort of the the, the threats and, and the sort of the, the sad notes. And, you know, climate change is on everybody's um, mind. Uh, it's very clearly happening, although it's nice and cold out tonight. But uh, we're in the middle of the warmest, we just had the warmest January in recorded history. Um, oddly enough, I've, I've spent about 15 years now working on this and have come to the, I think, very encouraging conclusion that our forests are probably the least sensitive to climate change of any forest anywhere in the world. And, and, and trees in particular, uh, our temperate trees in particular, you know, they evolved specifically, they're here specifically because they can tolerate climatic extremes. That's what differentiates them from, say, tropical trees. And they all occur across a pretty broad range of climates. So the mean annual temperature here in, in Clinton is about eight degrees Fahrenheit, about 47 degrees, uh, eight degrees centigrade, about 47 Fahrenheit. And so most of the species that we have here, you know, occur, you know, uh, you know, so uh, red maple occurs all the way down to Texas. And um, as I said, you know, beech gets all the way up into Nova Scotia. Um, and so we have, you know, um, and the adults are remarkably tolerant of a broad range. It's the seedlings that are sensitive. And so, you know, yes, in, you know, a couple hundred years, um, you know, the, the seedlings of some of these species will no longer uh, be successful here. Things like balsam fir, which is already at its southern range limit, uh, we expect to disappear quite quickly. But by and large, um, uh, you know, I, I have... I've not been able to convince myself that climate change per se is going to have major impacts for at least about 200 years. So I think that's good news um, uh, and, and I'm gonna leave it at that. So I'll wrap up and, and just say, you know, just a couple of final words. Uh, it, you know, um, if, if you study trees for any length of time, you, you, you get a lot of respect for, again, for their ability to tolerate extremes, for their ability to persist, and, um, and for the importance of history in determining what you see on the landscape. Um, and so I really do think of them as drifting um, with currents. Um, and, uh, um, but many of these changes are, are, are fairly inexorable. You know, the the fire suppression that really began over a hundred years ago, um, we no longer have to suppress uh, many fires because they're just so less frequent. But the impacts of that 
transformation of that early fire suppression are going to play out for hundreds of years in a relative balance of oaks and maples, for instance. So um, scientists are not supposed to have beliefs, but they do. Um, we have beliefs informed by the strength of the evidence from our research. And, and then we sort of weigh the, the strength of all that evidence and as, essentially assemble um, our understanding of how a system works. And so, you know, they, these forests, you know, this we were very fond of this notion of steady state and that there was some primeval state that we should be, um, you know, trying to manage for. Um, I don't believe that's really um, uh, practical in any way, and it's not even theoretically relevant. Um, these legacies are ubiquitous. And what this really means is that, um, you, you know, these forests are sort of sailing off into a, into a, a new world. They're, you know, it's not that, yes, we have a remarkable recovery of forest cover. Um, the biomass of forests on the landscape is still well below what it was 500 years ago, but the recovery in that sense is really quite remarkable. I, I can't quite bring myself to let go of this almost romantic um, notion of this primeval forest. Um, and it is still guiding a lot of our, um, a lot of the way we think about conservation and management. Uh, but I really think it's an open question whether uh, just how relevant that notion of the forest primeval is. Um, I don't see us going back. So I'm going to stop there um, and stop sharing my screen. And as usual, I talked much longer than I wanted. But I don't know if Cynthia is going to moderate or um, or how, if at all, you want to handle questions? I, I certainly, certainly will try to moderate, but I've got a terrible. I mean, if people are comfortable using the raise the hand raising icon or just jumping in, I'm happy to. Good. Do whatever I okay. can. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Can I ask? I don't know what to do. Turn up, turn up the volume. Oh. I unmuted it, but you have to turn up the volume. Why did you turn up? Oh. You can't use your finger. Just, oh, that's right. Just leave it. Your screen is frozen. It's not working. Oh. Yeah, let's try to get somebody else to handle this. Oh, there, you go. there we go. There. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? I think I think the best thing to do would be to ask Kathy Mann could moderate. Is Kathy? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think, Cynthia, you're getting a bit of an echo from something there. Feedback, think, oh, yeah. Cynthia, if, if you want to jump in, jump in. We've all been on long, crazy Zoom meetings with uh, too many people, but, you know, it can yes. work. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Do you feel that the Forest Act is something that really makes sense so far as for people under the 480A? Well, it's a clumsy program. You know, it's an old program. There have been lots... You know, New York State came close to revising it a few years ago, but then did something really silly. And instead of paying the local towns directly when someone harvested, they said, give the money to the state and we'll give it to the towns. There's not a town in New York that thought that made sense. Um, the, the, you know, CLCPA, the new climate law, envisions some, some big changes um, to try to promote sort of forest stewardship more broadly than simply um, promote, you know, the, the problem is how do you compensate towns for the lost tax revenue? I mean, I'm on, right. I'm on the town zoning board and I'm, I'm quite keenly aware of, of town budgets. We all are, we pay taxes. And if somebody can figure out um, a really clever way to compensate the towns 
for lost tax revenue, I would love to see 480A broadened to to lessen the imp the requirement that you do harvest and then generate stumpage returns to the towns. Did, did that help? Did, did that? No, no, absolutely. I was just kind of curious. You hear pros and cons. We had land that was in it for many years. The folks who now have it also kept it in it. And you know, you hear pros and cons that you know they're you're saving a lot of money that people can't go on those lands at all, and yet they're getting a big tax break. So you hear both sides to it. Yeah, right? I, 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 um, I don't have a good. I have not been able in my own mind to come up with a policy that I think resolves those, those dilemmas. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Hey. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Sure. Hey, Craig. Hi. Um, with the uh, loss of the uh, oaks and the beaches and the ashes and some others, are we doomed uh, long term to have only uh, surviving uh, maples? Yeah. Well, I, I, that is not unrealistic. As long as we don't get Asian longhorn beetles, which of course would would wipe out the maples. Uh, red maple is the most common tree in eastern North America. Sugar maple is the second most common tree. I tend to not count the loblolly pine plantations in, in that in that calculation, but and um, I still don't know where they were in 1750 in Dutchess County when the surveyors weren't using them as witness trees. Um, I, it, it's it's still I have a hard time explaining that, but the fact of the matter is they are doing phenomenally well. Now, red maple sprouts really prolifically. So even in, you know, the heavy cutting of a hundred years ago in the woodlots was good, but, but red oak was sprouted, but, um, you know, the oaks just aren't shade tolerant enough to, to, to compete with the maples. So I, I think it's fair to assume that, um, in fact, our simulations, when we, we use our very elaborate models, predict continued rise in the abundance of, of sugar maple and red maple over the next 200 years. Thank you. I, th I think I saw Margaret, Margaret Pierpont. Did you have your hand up? No. Does anybody else just want to jump in? Cynthia, I forgot how to put my yellow hand up. You're speaking, so go ahead, Risa. Well, I don't want to cut in front of all these people that have had their hands up, their yellow hands up forever. I haven't seen any. Relatively quick for me. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's two things. There's a few things. Um, and I live around the corner from you, as you know. And, of course, we're surrounded by maple trees. But what's really disturbing to me is the fact I've lived here continuously for 35 years. And that's not a lot compared to some people. But I'm a gardener and I know each of my trees intimately. And what I've seen is the, all my ash trees, all my, my dogwoods, all my um, four of the trees that were there aren't there. I blame mostly the fact that the deer eat, and I have, we have a big deer population here, so in the same neighborhood. And I blame it the fact that the deer are eating all the seedlings because I have no undergrowth anymore in my forest. I also I don't even have maples coming back because the deer eat the undergrowth. And by the way, I do have um, one of those, um, the trout lily, <laughs> just for, to let you know it's still surviving. So um, what bothers me is I've been plant I've been planting trees. I've been planting something is simple as a maple because there's no way and surrounding it also so not everybody can do that and so what are we what are we going to do now if we have all do you feel that the deer play a major role and then i will give you a second question and not say anything more well, let's, I'll, the, I'll make this quick the answer is yes they're having an impact um but we're not becoming scotland um you know uh, eventually you know, if there's enough light around, you can get enough regeneration. The deer won't eat it all. So, um, so you're yeah. optimistic. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, why do we have this movement now that is so strong, given the fact that we're losing our native trees, and then not due to the fact that the other trees that don't belong here are pushing them totally out? I accept whatever grows here to some extent. 
why do we have this when in fact of the matter is if you're talking about evolution of forests, why can't we allow some of these na non-native species that take, I'm not saying necessarily the locust or whatever, but why can't we be a little more flexible in that area? I think that's a, a matter of personal preference. Um, you know, most of the invasive plants in uh, in our neck of the woods, this part of the world, uh, are plants that were deliberately brought here for ornamental or agricultural purposes, and then they they spread. So um, people bring them here because they see a value in bringing them here. Um, uh, so I think that's just a matter of personal preference, Risa. But why don't we let um, uh, Frank or Gregory, I see hands up, um, but I think um, someone will have to unmute them. Where Greg, you? you need to unmute yourself. There you go. Okay, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> yeah, I know the deal. <laughs> That's okay. Um, thank you. Um, now, what I was going to ask was, uh, first of all, nice pre enjoyed your presentation. Um, with uh, what kind of partnerships do you do you see or have or experience with first of all the Department of Agriculture's Department of Forestry and you know on the federal level and what you know how engaging have they been you know is it a typical government or and or the Sierra Club and the National uh, Parks Conservation Group well I I um well first of all the US Forest Service runs the most remarkable, um, scientific program in the in the world in terms of inventorying the nation's forests. Since the 1920s, by law, they have been tracking the nation's forests using a really rigorous statistical design. And, and for almost 30 years, I've been working with their data. I have to have a, a the, the plot locations of their plots are secret by law. Um, I happen to uh, with a very elaborate security memorandum, I'm allowed to know where they are so that I can link the data to, say, climate data and other things. But uh, there are good reasons for this. So there's a remarkable, most of what we know at a really broad scale about the nation's forests comes from this program from the U.S. Forest Service. And, and they have a large research staff across the country. As you can imagine, the vast majority of their budget these days is devoted to fighting fires in the West. And so it just gobbles up almost all the money and all the interest for, for, for good reason. You know, the um, Eastern forests are responsible for about 80% of the carbon sequestration in the nation's forests. Um, the Rocky Mountain states are all a net source of carbon to the atmosphere because the forests are just burning. So Forest Service is a, is a remarkable organization. I have a lot of respect. I've worked with Forest Service scientists throughout my career. Um, uh, actually, the research I'm working on right now is funded by the Environmental De Defense Fund um, because they're interested in these questions of forest carbon. And uh, I've served on the boards of uh, Nature Conservancy chapters, the Adirondack Council, land trusts, and so forth. So, um, you know, it's interesting being a scientist in one of those organizations. I really like EDF because they don't come to me with a position and then ask me to, to justify it. They ask me what the science is, and then they figure out what that means in terms of their policies. And so, um, you know, science gets um, gets corralled by all sorts of different organizations for different purposes. And I've I've been really comfortable with, you know, being able to just tell them what I think, and then they can decide what to do with that information. So, uh, Frank, you. Uh, hi, uh, this is, uh, I assume you must do these presentations quite often. This is my first time being on. Um, question I've got is, are these presentations, I know it said it was being recorded. Are they available mm -hmm. on YouTube? Because I have somebody, a friend of mine that um, couldn't make it on tonight. And I think she would yes. be very interested in, in uh, seeing this. Yes, Frank, I am recording it and it will be on the uh, Historical Society's website. Are you a member? I am not, no. Maybe in your in the chat, you could give me your email address so I can let you know when it's out there. Okay, okay. that would be great. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathy, so you can just chat to me if you'd like. And, okay. and I'll make, okay. a plug, make a plug for the Cary Institute. Um, <laughs> you know, for instance, we used to do <laughs> Friday night seminars. We have a lovely auditorium, but it could still only fit 130 people. 
And with, with COVID, we started doing these things online and having seven, 800 people tune in and those are all recorded and available. So, you know, oddly enough, I think a lot of organizations discovered that you could reach a much bigger audience this way. I still really wish I was in a room with all of you. It's much more fun to be able to see you <laughs> as I'm talking. Uh, you, also, you can get me to stop talking more easily that way, but, um, uh, you know, but yeah, no, there's, you know, it's, it's a silver lining to this, <laughs> this remote uh, access issue. So Kathy, we're, we're, we've run over. Um, I'm happy, you know, I'm sitting at home comfortably, so I'm happy to take any more questions people have, but if, uh, if you want to cut us off, please do. Does anybody have any more questions? Yeah, I do. Go ahead, Herb. Yeah, uh, get my video on here. Come on, behave yourself. Well, while that's working, I'll ask the question. Uh, we seem to notice here in Hyde Park, we have noticed here in Hyde Park, uh, I'm sorry, I have my microphone out of the way. We've noticed here in Hyde Park, uh, the deer population dropping. Uh, we don't see them very much at all. Uh, yeah. Just a couple. Well, I, I, you know, the same thing. I, well, you know, I, I live near Risa, but we, about 20 years ago, we put up a, a deer fence around an acre around our house because we love to garden too, and you just can't garden with the deer population the way it was. But in the last few years, this uh, hemorrhagic fever that's hit the deer population has had an impact. Um, you know, we used to see a, a doe herd come behind our fence to go to the apple trees at our next door neighbor's yard, you know, almost every day. And I have not seen those deer in months. Um, I do expect the population to rebound. Um, you know, there are a couple of things happening. I, you know, I was driving home from Millbrook late last night and a coyote zipped in front of my car on the Taconic. There's some evidence that the coyotes are beginning to become more adept at taking fawns. Um, you know, the bear population will have an impact. Uh, bears will, will prey on fawns as well. Um, automobiles remain the main source of more, hunters and automobiles are the number one and number two sources of mortality. But, you know, the hunting populate, the hunting tends to take mostly the bucks, not the does. And so, um, so, so Herb, I think you're correct that, I think if you ask the DEC deer biologists, they would say, yes, indeed, deer numbers are lower right now and they have been trending downward over time. Um, uh, at the same time, they're still high enough that they're having impacts at the landscape scale. So it's, it's um, and I, my guess would be that this, this outbreak of this hemorrhagic fever will, will pass by and we'll, we'll see some rebound in the numbers. It's odd. I mean, I add to that deer situation is that um, some very, very large property owners um, in Clinton, actually, that I've heard about have hired people to come on their property and take down the deer and it's an agree it's a it's a governmental agreement and then the meat because they know where it's come from and taken it down is then used for um to give to the poor is that true well uh, not quite but um so for instance the Cary institute for almost 50 years we've had a controlled hunt where um recreational hunters are uh, um, um, are used to control the deer population there by getting them to shoot does, and it had a big influence. It's been remarkably successful. The forests at the arboretum have a very good understory. If you put a deer fence up at the arboretum, as we have done, you don't see any impact. So the deer densities are low enough to uh, to have be having very little impact on the forest. Um, I don't. Uh, I think it is the case. I think it is the case that well, you certainly cannot commercially sell uh, white-tailed deer meat. Um, that's that's a legacy of these laws designed to prevent people from uh, uh, commercially. I was wondering meat. about that. Yeah, but um, I have heard that it is possible to donate the meat to food pantries. I don't know the details, though. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. No, I was just curious that. about that part, but I do know that people have had their properties hunted by organizations. Yeah, that, that's just what Carrie is doing. 
Right. That's perfectly reasonable. I see John Vanderlee has you know, before before we move on, I just want to mention something oh. you prompted me to think about. Uh, you're talking about the uh, gardens and deer. Uh, uh, I'm not a gardener. Matter of fact, I claim I'm, I'm such a bad gardener that last summer my rock garden died. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, that aside, uh, a, a few years ago, I did try my hand at raising some cherry tomatoes, and I was so successful, I, I needed a, a, a stepladder to pick them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were growing like crazy, and I had no uh, fences, uh, uh, no, no poisons, nothing uh, to protect them against the animals. Uh, and what I had discovered uh, quite by accident, the growing near my cherry tomatoes, were uh, wild mint. Hmm. And so you and I, seafood, eat food, the Bambi smell food, eat food, but they couldn't smell the, the tomatoes for, for the mint. It was extremely successful. <laughs> That's a lot of mint. <laughs> I know, it just wasn't very much, really. I think John Vanderlee had a question. Um, yeah, it's not so much a question, that's just a, just a statement. Um, I, I worked at Vassar College a number of years ago, and uh, you know, they had that farm there, and it was really getting overrun with deer, and um, uh, they, had a, um, uh, they had an effort there to reduce the deer population, which yeah. caused a lot of noise, but, but it was really necessary. But I do know that all the meat from the, those hunts were given to the uh, food pantries in okay. pantries in Poughkeepsie. So that's yeah. that's a fact. And now I have a totally unrelated question. Um, do uh, does forest cover have any effect on vernal pools? Well, um, you know, most of the most of the action in a vernal pool is in is in the spring before full leaf out, and so. You know, the oaks, one of the key differences between the oaks and the maples is that in the spring, the oaks are busy producing wood to transport water up to the leaves before they can put the leaves out because those mm -hmm. large vessels cavitated over winter. And so the, the oaks leaf out a couple of weeks after the maples. And so historically, there would have been a longer period of time in the spring before those pools were shaded. And so they probably warmed up sooner and better. And that may have affected the amphibians um, that lived in those vernal pools, for instance. You know, I don't know whether, you know, the presence of a maple understory, which leaves out a couple of weeks earlier, it's, it is possible. I, you know, you know who I would ask would be Eric Kiviat at Hudsonia. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and um, the reason why I ask is, I mean, uh, uh, because I, you know about this work on, uh, uh, on the power lines. Mm -hmm. And and I used to have a nice strip of woods uh, um, on on the end of my property, and there were, and there were vernal pools there, which are quite busy and got very busy in the spring, mm -hmm. and uh, they basically took all the trees down. And I was just curious how that was going to affect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I, I can't. I I don't know, John. I, I really I, I can see I can, I can see countervailing um, influences mm -hmm. happening. Um, uh, you know, I, I could certainly see, for instance, um, too much insulation, too much sunlight uh, causing thermal stress, for instance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think it would, it would play out differently for different species of, of insects and amphibians. And so, you know, there always seem to be winners and lo losers <laughs> uh, anytime you change the environment. So I, I again, I, I, if, 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 if we had Eric Kivy out here, I would ask Eric and I would take whatever he said as gospel. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, Barbara Sweet has a question and then Frederick Putman, Putnam has a question. Okay, thanks, Kathy. And uh, very good talk, Charlie. Thank you. Uh, I wondered, uh, you, this may not be your area, but do you know if anyone uh, in let's say the Hudson Valley, is doing any uh, project with motion detected uh, cameras looking for deer, et cetera. There's a program going on out in Wisconsin mm -hmm. where uh, they are tracking the deer. Um, yeah, it's really, um, 
we, we were using them in, in our Lyme, in the Lyme disease research. I mean, you may be aware that, you know, Rick Ostfeld and, and Felicia Kiesing have led this work, but I've been involved in it for almost 30 years. And, you know, there's a, there's a, a linkage between the diversity of animals in a forest and the risk of Lyme disease. And, and typically the more diverse the animal populations, the less likely a tick will feed on, a, on the, the few animal species that are really uh, um, prolific carriers of the, of the disease, the spirochete. And so we were using uh, motion cameras to just try to get a sense of where and what was occupying. And it, it actually, my wife got me one of those cameras as a Christmas present a couple of years ago, and and it sits out back. And mostly, I pick up deer. Every once in a while, I get a coyote. Um, my neighbor next door has picked up bobcats and and uh, fishers and so forth. And I agree that the I, I just read about this program in in Wisconsin, and it's remarkable. It, it's essentially a sort a form of citizen science. It, 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 but you can actually collect really valuable scientific data with these cameras. Um, and uh, it's getting easier and easier to, to use um, image processing to, to cycle through them. Otherwise, you spend a lot of time sitting there scrolling through. We had research assistants who had to go through thousands of these of these shots, mostly you know one ear of a deer and trying to figure out what it was. Um, but um, computers are getting so much better at image processing that um, you know, with as many cameras as that program in Wisconsin was using, I hope they were using a computer to scan them and, and figure out what they were seeing, because otherwise some poor undergraduate was was uh, spending a lot of time staring at a screen. Of course, that's what they do most of the time anyway. So I suppose this is, you know. Do you know of any program that is going on here in Dutchess County? You know, I, I don't, although the other big use of this is, you know, one of the big signals of climate change was uh, was change in the seasonal timing of biological events so phenology when do trees leap out when, and so there are there's a national network there's actually one of these cameras on the roof of our lab of the lab building the lichens lab at, at the carry that was focused on a couple of, of big huge oak trees right outside my office window unfortunately the grounds crew insisted on cutting down those oak trees because they were dropping branches piercing the flat roof above my office, which then leaked. Um, so this camera, which is supposed to be tracking for years what's happening with the phenology of these oak trees, the oak trees are gone now. But um, those those networks tend to be online and available. Um, and they're just sort of tracking this change, um, you know, how early do birds arrive, um, when do things, certain things flower and so forth. Um, but I don't know of uh, Barbara, I don't know of anybody formally doing this as a citizen science program in Dutchess County. I, get, I, I don't, I'm not aware of one. Thank you. Uh, Frederick Put or Penny Putnam. I'm, I'm mute. Uh, uh, you're muted. We can't hear you. Unmute yourself. Oh dear, she's still going to work. There we go. Okay. No. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> hi, I'm Penny Putnam. Um, two questions. They're very different questions. We have a 50 acres of house and forest. Uh, there are areas that we can see from the house where we would like to encourage undergrowth by raking decades and decades and decades of leaves away. I'm not sure if that is good for what might be under there or not. <laughs> the other question is the distress we feel when we drive up the Taconic or up 684 and see all the vines that are covering the trees along the highway. You don't see that here in our forest, but- Yeah, so two what, things. What two things. do they do about these vines? Leave the leaves, the leaves, right. the, the, no, leave them there. They are um, a, um, a significant amount of the nutrient cycle in a forest cycles through those leaves. I, I do have neighbors who insist on removing the leaves. Um, so about 10% of the potassium that the trees need each year is in the annual leaf fall. If you remove it every year, you're going to deplete the, the potassium stocks in the soil by 10%. And you can see where that goes, right? Pretty soon you're gonna have nutrient deficiencies in your, in your, in your uh, trees. Th those leaves are also important habitat for all sorts of invertebrates. 
uh, insects and things and, and, you know, in the understory. So yeah. leave, the, leave the leaves. It drives me nuts when I see people raking their forests. The other thing is everybody sort of seems to want Central Park as their woods and um, and they, they cut down all the saplings. So it's not it's bad enough that the deer are taking them. And then, and then I have a neighbor over on, on uh, Shadblow who's just gone through his entire many acres of woods and, and, and cut everything that wasn't at least this big around. So sorry, uh, but, but um, you know, I, I once wrote a chapter in a book entitled Neatness is Not a Virtue. And nothing about nature really wants to be neat. Um, the vines are an interesting story, though, and it is, you're absolutely right. Um, south of here, uh, uh, there's this thing we, we call invasional meltdown, and a lot of these sort of urban forests are just falling apart, and, and it seems that everything conspires to um, create just this, this sort of a disintegration of the ecosystem, if you will. But, but vines are really sensitive to cold weather. And so we are pretty much right at the northern range limit for a lot of these vines. And every year as the winters get warmer, the vines seem to be spreading northward. Um, you know, the, the furthest, like, you know, think of the tropics. Vines are a huge, lianas are a huge component of tropical forests. And, um, you know, we only have, you know, poison ivy, Virginia creeper, and a native grape are really our only common native vines that can tolerate the really cold winters. Uh, but a lot of the, you know, Smilax and things like that um, that are sort of taking over in these urban forests, right now we are just a little bit north of where they're really comfortable. And I worry that over time we're going to see more and more of them spreading north. Uh, exactly why there's such a problem in those urban forests is not entirely clear. It seems like it's just a combination of insult and injury that makes those forests sort of succumb to that invasion. It's, it's, uh, it's always been a bit of a mystery to me why they're so vulnerable. Thanks. I, I see Noreen has a hand up. Hi, Noreen. This is my son, Bayard. <laughs> oh, hi. Hi. This is Bayard Fattler, my hi. son. I'm, I'm Noreen's son. Um, oh, good to meet great you. talk. Thank you. Good to meet you, too. Um, so I had two, two questions, um, both unrelated. Uh, the first is, um, so at my parents' house in, I guess you'd call it West Clinton, um, there are a lot of maple trees that have lichen on them, mm -hmm. or what I think is lichen. And, um, you know, it's certainly, uh, it doesn't seem to be, you know, any detriment to the trees, but it's been spreading for 20 or 30 years at least. I'm just wondering, is that a common? Is well, that no, I, I think that's one of the most encouraging things happening. So, um, you know, lichens, so for about, well, since 1985, as part of the inventory of the forest, um, by law, the Forest Service has been tracking lichens because they're a very a good indicator of air pollution. And so areas, as, as air quality has improved, um, the lichens have come back. Oh. And and so there, there's certainly not any detriment to the trees, yeah. and um, you know they're they're just they're using mm -hmm. the trees as a substrate. I mean they're actually pretty happy on rock too, uh, most of the species. Um, but um, I just had this question uh, from someone else recently. I was out for a walk, and and uh, no, I, I I think it's one of the most encouraging things I see in the woods. So uh, that, that's the first part. What was the second part? Yeah. Great, good, good. So that means a healthy forest. Yeah. Um, so this, the second part is uh, along 9G in particular, um, I see a lot of uh, stands of dead trees, uh, much more so than in, you know, in the last five or 10 years. Uh, they seem to be associated with beaver. I, I think- Well, that, that, those are, th those are a, a lot of that could be beaver, but there's an enormous amount of, of ash mortality along 9G. Um, in, in particularly in lower wetter areas, um, and uh, uh, and that's emerald ash borer. Um, you, you know, there uh, it's sort of heart heartbreaking. Um, well, I actually I, I I use white ash in in the boats I build. It's a it's a marvelous tree, um, and uh, you know it's a. Uh, you know, it's only about seven, eight percent of the biomass of New York forest, but it's particularly common on on a higher pH soils and lower 
sort of more fertile soils. So a lot of what you're seeing is, is ashes that have died from emerald ash borer. But certainly if, if a beaver had come in and raised the water level, water table, quite often that'll kill the trees um, you know, that weren't expecting it, that aren't adapted to um, um, ana you know, anaerobic soils. So it could, could be either one, but most, I think most of what you're seeing is emerald ash borer and ash trees, unless you, unless you notice that they're not ash trees that are dying. Well, I, I, I don't know if they're ash or not. I'll have to take a closer look. Um, but, it, but most of them seem to be in standing water at least, you know, six well, inches deep. So to well, me, it seemed like there were, you know, it seemed like beaver, but I don't, yeah, have, well, that, the beaver, have the beavers made a comeback? Well, uh, um, well, certainly yes, from when they were, they, they were trapped completely out in, in uh, you know, 1720. Um, and for instance, in the Adirondacks, beaver were largely almost eliminated and have made a dramatic comeback. Um, unfortunately, they've also been reintroduced to Patagonia where they're wrecking havoc. Um, and I, I think England just finally reintroduced their beaver. And, and um, so, you know, <clears throat> beaver are, are commonly called an ecosystem engineer. So for instance, a lot of the, you know, the early colonists when they were looking for fields to plant, the first thing they looked for was a recently abandoned and drained beaver meadow, right? You, you know, those were about mm -hmm. the best soils because that that dam had had collected sediment behind it for years. It was also so it was it was the most productive and open land around. Um, so beaver. Um, I remember when I was doing my PhD in the Adirondacks, I would, my base camp was you know, eight, 10 miles in from the road. And each year, I, the question was, what had the beaver flooded and what, what was I gonna have to wade through? So when beaver move into a new area and flood it, they will kill the trees in many cases. Um, we have a bunch of, uh, you know, great blue heron rookeries around Dutchess County that are in recently flooded and uh, full of now dead trees. And uh, there's there's a, you know, big patch of it on, on Fiddler's Bridge Road near me. They're, there are some of them along the Taconic as well. So it's just a natural cycle, but that's what beaver do. Right. So beaver certainly changed the landscape. But yeah. anyway, I appreciate it. this is a great discussion tonight.